All right, so here we're going to learn about aerobic respiration in bacteria, all the different steps, and then we'll have a separate video that will talk about the different types of glycolysis. So this is most likely the cellular respiration equation that you have learned previously. In people, we only use oxygen as our final electron acceptor. So in humans, cellular respiration and aerobic respiration are synonymous. So people normally say cellular respiration and they mean as compared to fermentation. In bacteria, there are two types of respiration. So let me right, re-show you this like drawn all on sheet. Um, so there's aerobic respiration, which has an oxygen electron acceptor, and there is anaerobic respiration, which has a non-oxygen but still external electron acceptor. And then down here at the bottom of this page, there is fermentation. So if you see an equation like this for bacteria, you're going to want to cross off cellular and write aerobic, because you need to remember that although all respiration has, right, electron transport chain, ATP synthase, and external electron acceptor, all respiration in bacteria does not use oxygen as the external acceptor. It can be a different non-oxygen, but still external to the process electron acceptor for anaerobic respiration. Okay. So these are the steps of aerobic respiration of glucose. Uh, we are going to start with glucose because everybody starts with glucose. It's really well characterized. And once you know the steps for glucose, you can pretty much fit any other nutrient into the process. We will do that later, but we're going to start with glucose. So we will learn these four steps, and then these are the sections in the text where you will find additional information about each step, should you need it. So bacteria have the option of three different glycolysis pathways, uh, which they can use somewhat simultaneously. Weird, but true. And so um, the one that we are going to learn first uh, because it is the one that you secretly know the best, is called emden meyerhoff parnas or EMP glycolysis. This to you will be normal glycolysis. So this is the one that you have learned before in GenBio. Um, yeah, you feel like this is normal glycolysis. Happens in the cytoplasm of the cell, takes the 6-glucose, um, adds a phosphate, makes it into pyruvate, you get Anyway, by the end, you have turned it into two three-carbon pyruvates. Um, this whole process makes four ATP by substrate level phosphorylation, which remember happens in the cytoplasm and is the transfer of a high energy phosphate not requiring ATP synthase. Um, anyway, rewind yourself back to GenBio. You will undoubtedly remember Dr. Knight saying, but it's two ATP net. He made you memorize all the steps. We do not care about the steps in the slightest. Do not memorize the steps. Also, in this process of bond breaking, electrons are released, and those electrons are going to be captured. Remember, there always has to be some sort of electron recipient. We cannot have the electrons just wandering about in the cell. And so the electrons will go here to NAD+, plus, uh, which, remember, it carries two electrons, but since it starts with a plus, um, it just becomes NADH, not NADH2, uh, just NADH. Okay, so this is like normal glycolysis. Moving on. So I have given you guys this flow charty. It's not a flow chart. It's just a chart. I don't know if I can find mine right off the bat. Eek. Um, right. I will locate it later when we are between videos, and we'll talk about filling it out. Uh, but for the chart, you will need to answer some questions like this. Um, and you'll need to have the chart finished by Wednesday when you come to class. So 
uh, for EMP glycolysis, again, remember, you are actually forbidden from using the word glycolysis because bacteria can do three different ones. So you have to specify EMP glycolysis if you mean this one. Is oxygen required? No. Uh, where in the cell does this happen? Is the cytoplasm? What happens to the carbons? Um, so we go from one six carbon to two three carbons. All right, so I printed out this um, picture of glucose to show you guys. There's the linear one and the ring one because I wasn't sure which one you would like to see. Um, so the linear one is easier for me to understand um, in glycolysis, so I'm going to point at that one, but if you like the ring one, great. Uh, so here is our six carbon D glucose. And so right in pyruvate, we are going to cut this bond here. Let me just reach around the video to the scissors. Right? So this is a partial oxidation because we have taken some electrons. Every time you take electrons, you break bonds, right? When you donate electrons, those electrons are build to, used to build new bonds, but when you are oxidizing something, you're taking away electrons. Let me scoot this for a second. So this is a partial oxidation. We have broken one of the bonds, but there are still a bunch of other bonds here between the carbons that we could break further to get out additional energy and electrons. And so I will often ask you, is the carbon at this stage partly or fully oxidized? Because what I am really asking you is, can we still use it to get energy and electrons or is it done? And so until you break the glucose down completely to carbon dioxide, some, some bacterium somewhere can always use it to get energy and electrons from. And so that's why I will be asking you this partly or fully oxidized. Okay, uh, so in EMP glycolysis, in all glycolysis actually, uh, the carbon is partly oxidized because we are going to be making pyruvate, which still has some carbon to carbon bonds we can break later. The initial electron donor in this case is glucose. The final electron acceptor just for EMP glycolysis is NAD+, which is going to be NADH. Uh, this is the same as our electron carrier, uh, and it is a coenzyme. Is ATP made? Yes. How do we do it? Substrate level, phosphorylation. Let me zoom out a weensy bit. Ooh, wrong way, sorry about that. Um, and then amount of ATP. Here's the situation. I have this on the chart and I am gonna write two net. Uh, but the real story is nowhere in any of the test questions ever will there be how many ATP are made. There might be like how is ATP made substrate level or oxfos because oxidative phosphorylation always makes way more. Um, but I'm never going to ask you how many are made. I might ask you if there are some made or if there are not some made and how they are made, uh, but I'm never going to ask you how many are made. So you don't actually need to learn that even though I made a blank for it. Okay, so this is EMP glycolysis and is the one that we're going to use as standard glycolysis for aerobic respiration. Uh, next we have pyruvate, I've zoomed out too much, pyruvate oxidation and the Krebs cycle um, or the TCA cycle or the citric acid cycle or whatever you call it. So in pyruvate oxidation, um, which is not really on here, so this going from pyruvate to carbon dioxide is both pyruvate oxidation and Krebs. So Pyruvate oxidation by itself takes you from the three carbon pyruvate, it's this bit right here. This part. So this is pyruvate oxidation. Um, takes you 
right. From the three carbon pyruvate, you lose one carbon as carbon dioxide, and then you're left with the two carbon acetyl-CoA. Uh, the two carbon acetyl-CoA is what is then going to enter into the citric acid or Krebs cycle. Um, because we have broken a bond, right? When we break bonds, we release what? When we break bonds, we release electrons. Those electrons need an electron carrier. And so in this step, um, we are holding the electrons and producing some additional NADH. So once we have acetyl-CoA, again, acetyl-CoA is what will go into the Krebs or citric acid cycle. Um, this is going to be important later, as you'll see, because if the bacterium is digesting other nutrient sources like proteins or fats, um, then those other compounds will often be broken into acetyl-CoA and then come into the Krebs cycle. So acetyl-CoA is super important. So the making of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA happens in pyruvate oxidation, and we produce two NADHs. Once we get the acetyl-CoA, it will go into the citric acid cycle. Um, you do not need to know any of the intermediate compounds in the citric acid cycle. Please do not learn those. Um, we will not use them for this class. So you'll need to know that acetyl-CoA comes in, that there is a cycle, and that the carbons come off as carbon dioxide. And in the process of doing all of this rearranging and breaking bonds, we produce a large number of electron carriers, both NADH and FADH2. So this is the first time that FADH2 has shown up. Um, again, similar to the number of ATP, you will not need to know how many NADHs and FADH2s are made you will need to know which ones are produced in which process. So pyruvate oxidation makes just NADH. Uh, the citric acid cycle makes both NADH and FADH2. We don't care about the number. Um, okay. Also in the citric acid cycle, there are produced two GTP by substrate level phosphorylation. A lot of times in GenBio, they tell you that GTP is like ATP. It is. It is a high energy molecule. Uh, we will learn for exam four that GTP is very specifically made in, not made, very specifically used in translation in the protein production process. And you guys might remember that GTP is also used in the stringent response to signal for protein starvation. It is used to produce the alarmone PPGPP. And so GTP is a high energy compound similar to ATP, but it has its own specific role. Um, one other thing I want to show you just in case you're super nosy and you have noticed this and it's weirding you out is right here, it says NADPH. Um, so I don't know if you guys remember when we were very first talking about electron carriers and catabolism and anabolism. I told you that NADH is typically used to carry catabolic electrons from a whatever electron source to the electron transport chain. And thus the electrons from NADH are ultimately used to power oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, NADPH typically carries electrons for anabolism such that electrons carried by NADPH are used to form new bonds. Um, so sometimes, just depending on the balance of electron carriers in the cell, sometimes when you run the Krebs cycle, you'll get NADH here, sometimes you get NADPH here. Um, but that's why it's written with the P in the bracket. Uh, one other thing that I just remembered that I was supposed to be telling you is that um, both glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, and the Krebs cycle um, work as kind of double duty processes. So they are themselves catabolic processes because they are breaking down things, but all three of them work in the service of anabolism because 
usually break the completely, right? They usually break them into these small organic molecules, and these small organic molecules are used by the cell to make other things. And so glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, and Krebs cycle are catabolic processes, but they support both catabolism and anabolism in the cell. I think that that's one of your blinks. Um, okay, oops, let me zoom out again. I'm using the Elmo camera, if you guys remember it from Zolab. It's the one I used to film the sharks. Um, and so I'm at the house, and earlier Sophie's in, and she starts to smell the camera and lick it, and I had to sit her outside. It was too much going on. Um, so is oxygen required in this process? It is not. Um, you will sometimes see people say that oxygen is required. It's not directly required in this process. You need oxygen to reproduce the NAD pluses in a reasonable quantity, um, but oxygen is not directly used in this process. So what happens to the carbons? We go from the three carbon pyruvate to at the end of the Krebs cycle, three one carbon carbon dioxides. Do you guys remember a couple of slides ago we talked about the importance of being partially or fully oxidized, okay? So carbon dioxide, I'm just going to draw this over here, is fully oxidized. All of the bonds between the carbons are broken, and so your average bacterial cell cannot get more, oopsie, cannot get more energy and electrons out of this. So CO2 is our waste carbon product for this process. So this is important to know. Our initial electron donor, um, since we're considering these together, we could say pyruvate. If you're just considering the Krebs cycle, you could say acetyl coenzyme A. Final electron acceptor would be NAD plus or FAD. Uh, electron carriers, the same. Is ATP made? Yes, the metabolism is substrate level because again, this is happening in the cytoplasm, and um, the only option for ATP synthesis in the cytoplasm is substrate level, and we do not care about the amount. Okay, on to electron transport chain. Actually, I'm going to put this back up fast. Um, okay, so again, these are the four steps that we are looking at. So what is happening, right, in these first three is we are going from glucose to carbon dioxide, and then along the way, we are making a bunch of NADHs and a bunch of FADH2s. So it is in this bit that we are harvesting electrons, and then in the electron transport chain, we're going to use the electrons to generate a PMF, and then that PMF is going to be used in oxidative phosphorylation. Here, let me just scoot this up a little bit. Uh, to make gobs of ATP. And so the first three steps, we our main focus there is to break apart the organic carbon compound primarily to harvest electrons, although we also get a little bit of energy produced through ATP and GTP. By the end of the Krebs cycle, we've completely broken our glucose down to carbon dioxide. We are done with it. Um, it is now a waste product, and we cannot get any more energy and electrons for that. And then our energy carriers, sorry, our electron carriers will drop their electrons off at electron transport chain, a PMF will be generated, and that PMF will be used for swimming, right, or uh, to make ATP. So that's where we're going to go next. So, of course, bacteria are a little bit weird, and um, they have all these, like, weird electron transport chains. So we are actually going to primarily use the mitochondrial electron transport chain as our model. Um, it is super well understood and more typical. So we'll mention a couple of the bacteria ones, but they're a bit atypical. Um, okay, so I want you guys to see a couple things. So firstly, where is this happening, right? 
So this is in the membrane of the cell. Electron transport chains are always, always, always in membranes because you always are pumping something to one side and if you're not in a membrane, the thing will just come back on its own and that's no good. So electron transport chains are always, always in membranes. Um, you will notice that protons are being pumped across here as the electrons go down and so we are generating the PMF out here. Totally did not see that I had already put it down there. Oh well. Um, the other thing that I want you to see is the, you can't see that at all. Here we go, somewhat better. Um, the NADH, okay, so over here on the side, these, this red dashy line, is the E naught values, the reduction potential. So you guys remember the more negative, the better an electron donor something is, and the more positive, the better an electron acceptor some, something is, and the difference between the donor and the acceptor indicates the amount of energy released. So here is NADH, and then like a little bit below it is FADH2, okay? Down here at the bottom is oxygen. So this is a different view, right? So this is the reduction potential chart we used in class. I'm gonna have to zoom back in, sorry about this. All right, so up here at the top is our glucose, and then here is our NAD+, and then down a little bit is FAD. So FAD electrons are not worth as much energy as NADH electrons. So if you remember back in GenBio, Dr. Knight had you guys memorize like how many ATPs do you get per NADH and how many do you get for FADH2? You always get fewer ATPs per FADH2 um, because their electrons are not as high energy as the NADH ones. And then way down here at the bottom is oxygen. This is just kind of a graph showing you the different components of the electron transport chain. Here's oxygen down here at the bottom on a chart. And so that has the reduction potential here on the side. So here is our NADH. So remember the NADH is made in all three of our glucose breakdown steps. So it's made in glycolysis, made in EMP glycolysis, made in pyruvate oxidation, and made in the Krebs cycle. Then that NADH will come and donate electrons to the electron transport chain. As the electrons go down, they give up some energy to pump protons across the membrane, and that is what generates the PMF. And so this shows um, the electrons losing energy. Essentially, they are moving down this reduction potential chart until they get to oxygen at the bottom. And then as they move down, they will push protons to outside of the membrane and that generates the PMF. Okay, so, um, let me zoom out. All right, so since we are doing aerobic respiration, oxygen is very definitely required. We have no carbons at all happening here, right? Because in the first three steps, in EMP glycolysis, in pyruvate oxidation, and in the Krebs cycle, we completely oxidized or completely dismantled the glucose to CO2. So now we just have the remnant electrons, but we don't have any carbons left that we're dealing with. Uh, the electron donor is NADH or FADH2. The final electron acceptor for aerobic respiration is oxygen and it hopefully becomes water. Uh, our electron carriers in the electron transport chain are called prosthetic groups. The only one that I'm gonna ask you to learn about is cytochromes. Um, they have iron in them, and so you'll just hear about those a lot. I just want you to know what they are. So is ATP made? Yes. How is ATP made? So ATP is made here through oxidative phosphorylation, abbreviated oxphos. This is oxidative, oh, and we don't care about the amount. This is oxidative because the initial energy 
to create the ATP came from oxidation of chemical bonds. This is not called oxidative because we are giving the electrons to oxygen. It's because the energy initially came from an oxidation reaction. So oxidative phosphorylation um, is always associated with an electron transport chain because oxidative phosphorylation, it says it right here, but you guys can't see it. Oxidative phosphorylation is performed by ATP synthase and ATP synthase uses the PMF to power ATP production. And so in order to use a PMF, ATP synthase has to be in the membrane, which means that oxidative phosphorylation has to be adjacent to an electron transport chain. Um, if you guys really care about this, you can look in the book. What I think is the niftiest is it takes three, you don't need to know this, it just think it's nifty. It takes three protons to make each ATP, and as they go through, they change the structure of the ATP synthase a little bit. So it's kind of like they're going through like a turnstile onto the train or something. Um, so it's like click, 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 ATP, click, 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 ATP. Anyway, um, so that is aerobic respiration. Sorry that this was quite lengthy.